Good evening and good morning, depending on where you are. Um, we are live. Uh, I've been told that my camera might be a little bit blurry. Uh, we're trying to work that out, which is why I looked a little bit distracted a second ago, if you saw me. Um, but, uh, the, you know, it all adds to the excitement. Um, the chat is live. And if you've got any questions, go ahead and answer them in the chat window. And uh, I'll be here answering questions. Um, the actual presentation itself is pre-recorded. So uh, we'll play the pre-recorded presentation. And at the end, there'll be a and a And I'll be here for that. But uh, ask me questions anyway um, whilst we're going along, because I will be here um, answering them for you. OK. Speak to you, sir. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the country. And welcome to How to Create a Real Mac App Step-by-Step -step Guide. My name is Ian Barker, and I'm the Developer Advocate for Embarcadero Systems. If you want to get in touch, you can email me there at ian.barker at embarcadero.com. Well, we've got a lot coming up for you. Um, it's a busy time. I seem to have committed myself to doing a webinar every single Tuesday. Uh, we've also got a few on Fridays as well. Uh, today, we are going to be doing how to create a real Mac app step-by-step -step guide. That's today. Um, this Friday, or the next webinar, is um, about Codelex. Now, Codelex is a very, very interesting product. Um, it's from a company called GDK and allows you to do some very interesting things to do with your business logic. If you're not sure what business logic is, then maybe you should come along and watch the webinar. Um, if you do know what it is, then if I tell you that Codex is going to really transform the way you look at things, then it's worth doing. Um, it's going to be presented by Marco from GDK, and we're also going to have a special guest. Um, so come along on uh, Friday. It's the it's going to be the I think roughly the same time. But just sign up to the normal webinars, and you should receive your uh, your little um, uh, reminder. That's the word I'm looking for. Okay. Well, the very first thing you need to do um, with the Mac app, and today's going to be quite a busy webinar, so I'm going to skip through a few steps. A lot of what we are talking about today with uh, Mac apps also applies to iOS apps because obviously they're um, also from Apple as well. Um, you need to, before you can do absolutely anything at all, is sign on to Apple's developer portal. And uh, if you go to the URL that I've got listed there at the bottom, developer.apple.com, and use your Apple ID, you'll be able to... Um, sign up it will cost you some money it's not free um, there are two types of developer account there's the regular apple developer account for normal mortals people like you and me and others and then there's another one called an apple enterprise developer account that costs more money uh, in us dollars that's 299 for the enterprise developer account and uh, the regular one costs 99 dollars the enterprise developer account is used for um really for big companies where they're writing applications that are used by their staff exclusively. And uh, the regular developer account is for people that want to sell apps to anybody or use them uh, for their own purposes and to get them into the iOS and the Mac um, app stores. Good news is, to do Macs, you don't need an, an Apple Enterprise Developer Account. However, if you are going to do enterprise apps, then yes, you will need to sign up. But generally speaking, if you're just going to create regular app, Apple Mac um, apps, then go on there and read through the details. There are ways of getting um, free accounts and things like that, and I think they do some educational accounts as well. But generally speaking, you're going to be um, spending $99 and uh, signing up. It's open to anyone, unless you've been barred, and off you go. But yeah, you're saving a little bit of money there. You must have, no matter what you do, you must have Xcode installed and it must be working on the Mac. Um, now, that Mac doesn't have to be your own Mac. It could be someone else's Mac. If you work in a company and there's someone with a Mac, um, you can uh, get in Xcode installed on that Mac and then install a thing called PA Server, which we'll talk about in a minute, on their Mac. 
and uh, most of the time they won't know that anything's going on because they can just have a window uh, minimized and you can install PA server that way. They would need to sign up with your credentials. So it's got to be someone that you work with or you trust if you're using company credentials. That makes it a lot easier. But you can also use some of the services that we've um, found like um, Mac in Cloud and Mac Stadium um, that give you a hosted cloud-based Mac and uh, you can put PA server on those machines. In fact, those cloud providers actually come with them pre-installed. And I know certainly with Mac and Cloud, um, they try to keep up to date. And if you have got an older version of PA server on your um, Mac and Cloud account, if you talk to their support, they used to upgrade it. I, I haven't used them for about a year, but certainly that's what they used to do. They would uh, upgrade PA server for you um, so that it was latest version. Your PA server that's installed needs to match your version of rad studio so if you're using rad studio 12 then you need a, the pa server that matches that rad studio if you're using uh, rad studio 11.1 .1, for example then you would need the pa server that matches that they have to match up how do you set up pa server well follow the instructions on the mobile help wizard i know it seems weird and counterintuitive but that actually will work uh, it'll tell you how to copy pa server to the mac Essentially, there's a, a file called PA server and then a number. The number will be the version number of the PA server. It comes at a, a .pkg and you put that onto your Mac, copy it over there. Um, the mobile wizard will tell you where to find it, but it's the same PA server, whether it's for iOS or for Mac OS. Copy it onto your Mac and, and run it. Uh, once you double click the PA server, once you've got it installed, you double click and it opens a terminal window, a bit like the command window in uh, Microsoft Windows um, or DOS prompt. But it's uh, obviously Unix because this is Mac. Uh, double click on there, a terminal window will open. It'll ask you for a password. And uh, once you put in the password, make sure you note it down. So if you use a complicated password, you're going to need to reuse that later. So uh, make sure you've got that password um, uh, stored somewhere. And I suggest that what you do is one of the commands is uh, the letter I. Press the letter I, and that will give you the current um, IP address of your Mac. My Mac is set up so that uh, at random times the IP address will change. I also have a network that will randomize my IP addresses as well. It's to prevent hacking. Um, you can do a thing called a permanent assignment or a permanent lease for an IP address that makes it easier. So if you're on a network, that probably happens already. But uh, if you're not sure when you run PA server on your Mac, just press that I and that will give you your IP address. You're going to need that later if unless you're using um, machine names for the servers. Uh, when you get to PA server and you type I, you note down the IP address and then we are going to use it in Rad Studio. So swap back to your PC and then in the search bar at the top there, um, type in SDK. This is the easiest way to find it. And uh, click on enter. You'll get a little drop down of different commands. You want the SDK manager page. Um, that will take you here. Uh, click on connection profile manager and click on add. What you're adding here is the connection to that Mac IP address that you noted down earlier on. The platform, it should automatically notice what it is, but if not, select Mac OS and the one that works for you. I actually have an ARM Mac because I've got a Mac M1, um, but it doesn't matter, it will still work. Host name is either the name of the Mac if you've got um, host names enabled or the IP address of the Mac, depending on how you've got it uh, set up. If your Mac is called something like My Mac or Ian's Mac or something like that, then in the host name you can put the name. The port number, just leave it as it is, and then the password, put in a password that's secure. Um, in my case, I was doing a little demo there, and it's a one-letter password. Don't do that, because you're exposing a port across your network. You don't want to get hacked. While you're doing that, once you've got everything working, uh, click on Test Connection. Assuming that everything's set up properly, then it will say, Succeeded. And at that point, you're talking to the Mac. Uh, that means it's working and everything's ready to go. There is another step though. You need to now go onto the SDK manager, which you saw earlier on, and click on add. When you click on add, you are connecting to the um, Mac connection profile. And 
you will select the SDK version. So as you can see at the top, my Mac is a Mac OS ARM 64 bit. I'm going to use my Mac M1 connection, which is to a specific IP address on the specific port, which we set up earlier on in the connection. And then I'm going to choose the SDK version. Now, at the time that I'm recording this, the latest version of Mac OS is uh, Mac OS 14.2, but this will change um, if you're seeing this in a year's time or something like that. It could be 15 or whatever. You know, you know how Apple do. Every so often, it uh, it happens that they uh, upgrade, and you get a new version of the operating system. I tick on the box that says make the selected SDK active. The reason you would need that is you can have more than one SDK. Now, it's outside the scope of this webinar, how you download SDKs, but it is possible to load SDKs for earlier versions. It depends on the Xcode, and actually, um, by the time you watch this video, things could change because Apple do have a tendency to just change things as they see fit and uh, make life difficult for us. <laughs> but, uh, but it is possible to have more than one SDK. The same is true of iOS. If you saw my video about uh, making a real iOS app, all of this supplies, it's all the same thing. Um, go in there and, and choose the iOS SDK. I personally find that most Apple devices, just because of the way they work, are on the latest version unless the hardware is out of date. And this happens more with Mac OS. It's very typical to find a Mac that is using an older version of an SDK. With uh, iPhones, they tend to be, you know, either the very latest SDK or the one just before it. It's something that doesn't happen with Android. With Android apps, you very typically will find a very broad selection of different SDKs, different versions of Android operating system. But um, but on Macs, uh, you might have a couple of different versions. On iOS, you might not even have many more than one amongst your customers. It's a judgment call which ones you support. Um, obviously, the lower you go um, with the support, then the more compromises you make on to, in terms of features. And some of the latest features are only... Um, supported in later SDK. So it's up to you, do what you think works, but uh, my advice is always uh, target the latest one and you'll be fine. Download the SDK, well once you click on OK on that previous screen, something will happen. You'll see a load of things um, whizzing across your machine. Okay, uh, And in my case it's 46 things. These are the header files and the, uh, the C programmers out there and the C++ programmers out there amongst you will um, recognize where it says xlocale.h there um, but for the file name. That is a C++ header file or a C header file and uh, that's what it's getting down. So it's getting down the, um, the definitions that uh, link to the actual SDK itself. And that's used for the compiler so that we can produce um, applications and compile them on the Windows machine and it, it updates your local cache. And as you can see here, in my case, it's putting it into my um, OneDrive, uh, Documents, and Bucadera Studio SDKs. It just depends on what, what machine and where you actually store your your um, your uh, temporary files and things like that. It's a cache. If you get any questions about files that are already existing, um, what I do is I always click on yes to all. I, I actually, I have to confess, I don't know what the effect of that is. Um, all I know is that when I do it, everything works as normal afterwards. <laughs> so uh, I don't know whether you should say no or no to all, but I always say yes to all and it works for me. Um, if you're not sure, if you get a problem, then uh, you know, drop drop me a line in .barker at mbarkadero.com and I'll try and answer the questions and see what we can say. Eventually, though, it's going to come back and say, uh, operation completed. If there are any errors in the log section, then try again. At that point, you're done. That's it. That's all you need to have your um, Mac apps created on a Windows machine using a RAD Studio, and uh, you'll be able to compile and deploy them. Uh, it's, it's as simple as that. Now, the next thing we're going to do is do a demo. I'm going to show you how we create a Mac app for real and uh, how we deploy that over to the Mac and what happens after that. Okay, so what we're going to do now is actually create a Mac app. I'm going to start by multi-device multi application, blank application, click on OK. Now, um, what I'm going to do is go to the palette 
I'm going to pick a few components. The, the first component I want is a panel. And I'll show you why in a moment. Put that at the top. Uh, let's make that a certain height. Let's go for... Uh, let's have it 65. Yeah, that's about right. And then we're going to say, uh, where do we want it? We want it at the top, like this. So that's aligning it at the top of the um, page. What else do we need? Well, we need a button. So let's go to the palette and choose a button. Not difficult. I'm going to put that in here like that. And we are going to make our button uh, a specific size as well. So that it looks good. So let's say uh, height 27. So I think that might be little bit too small so let's just make it look pretty like that and we're going to put a caption on the button and we're going to say um, and because this is multi-device uh, show date um, we're just going to save our project for a second and we're going to call it um, a app because we can That. And we're going to call it my Mac app. Like so. And uh, what else do we want? We want uh, a switch. Or will become clear now. If you um, watched my webinar before for Windows, this is all going to look very, very familiar. And um, the last thing we want is a label, which we are going to put up here, like so. And we are going to hit F11, and we're going to say um, text uh, horizontal align. We want it to be uh, trailing. That just means it's going to be aligned to the right. Oops. So, just put it there like that. And we're going to say on the label, we're going to call it um, dark. Now, if you watch my win my Windows webinar, this is all going to sound very, very familiar, isn't it? Dark. Okay. And the final thing we want is we want a um, calendar control, like so. And we want this to look beautiful. So we're going to say client. And that's going to stretch like that because uh, the toolbar at the top is um, aligned to the top. And then the client area, when we say aligned to the client area, it fills the rest of the gap. Okay, so, so far, so good. Um, what else do we want to do? Well, let's... Um, let's make sure that we're actually uh, targeting our Mac first. So I'm going to say on Mac OS ARM and um, style is a Mac OS by the way. So all looking good so far. Now uh, if I um, compile that after a few seconds you'll find it's compiled. Okay and so it's successful down there. Um, that doesn't mean to say it's running on the Mac, it just means that it's working. Now, if you want to, we can hit F9, and what will happen is it will launch on the Mac. So it's deploying. What that means is it is sending that, um, it's talking to PA Server, if you remember PA Server, and it's sending the app down to the Mac, and then if I go onto my um, Mac app running on the Mac. Now, Right now, it doesn't do anything, and that doesn't, doesn't do anything. So we need to put some code behind there. But you get the general idea. And if you see, you can see that it is a proper Mac app, because there it says um, Mac app. This is how Mac uh, menus work. Window, yes, I can make it move to the left of the screen, all the rest of it. I can also make it maximize. And yes, it does uh, look correct. Uh, the slight um, delay, by the way, is because I'm doing this via remote desktop down to my Mac but 
there's a proper Mac app. Now, that's all very well and good. But what we want to do is go back to our, um, our Rad Studio and we actually want to make it do something. So first of all, let's, um, let's add some code for the button. So what we're going to do, double click on here and uh, add this line. All this does is shows a message, formats the date and time to be the long time and it's going to be whatever date is uh, selected on the calendar. So um, if I run that, deploys to the Mac there it is and if I click on that button choose you down the 16th if I pick this one uh, it's the 2nd of March there's the 2nd of March and so it is actually doing something so already we've got a, a Mac app that does actually do something you notice that the dialogue as well <coughs> is Macintosh style dialogue and uh, it's working Close that and go back to our IDE. Um, it looks a bit ugly at the moment. I mean, it's kind of grey and boring. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to add two other controls, and those are Starbucks. So this is number one, and we're going to call that um, we'll call that. Uh, Dark style. I'm going to add another one. Now, there are ways of doing this more dynamically um, than I've done here. Oh, I'll make that visible. Um, but we're going to call this uh, light star. Now, um, if you don't know what styles are, they are allow the program to be um, the skin, shall we say, the look and feel of the program to be changed automatically. Um, I'm going to use two specific ones. So I'm going to go into um, dark style. And I've got this pre set up here, but I'm going to use the um, impressive dark Mac style for the dark style. And you see down here are all the styles. I'm going to close this and it will say, do I want to save it? Yes, I do. And then for the light style, I'm going to double click again and I'm going to open this. And I'm going to choose, again, these are um, premium styles that um, that you can get from Get It. Light style. Yes. Okay. And... Uh, what we're going to do is go to the form by selecting it. You can do it in the structure here. And in the style book, we will choose um, light style by default. OK, so you can see there's a pretty color um, there for the light style. Save my project. OK, and um, if I instead chose the dark style, you can see it's a dark style. So that's that. That's interesting, but not very cool. So what we're going to do is um, go into here and we're going to write a bit of code. So let's just get rid of these um, things which really bug me. And we're going to create a thing. I'm going to paste some code in here. So I've done that to create the uh, make the um, presentation shorter. Set the theme. OK, so what we're going to do here is we're going to say um, if the um, if this is set to true then it's going to use dark mode and if it's set to false then we're going to use the light mode and then the other thing we need to do is um, go into the switch and say on the events uh, there's a switch event it's like a click event for a switch and we're just going to say <clears throat> put some color on the end um, depending on the value of the switch we're going to use dark style or light style okay hit f9 it compiles on the machine uh, and links it all up using the compiler 
on the Windows machine. It then deploys it, which means it's copying it over to the Macintosh using the PA server, which is a specialized server that runs on the Mac. And I told you earlier on about how to install all of that. And you've seen it before on iOS. And uh, it signs a package. And then eventually, if I go into it, um, there is your app. If I now do this, ta -da! dark mode, light mode. And uh, there's the date as well. All very clever stuff. And uh, that really is the long short of what to do. Now, you might say, well, that, that's great. I mean, but wouldn't it be good if when the app ran, instead of having to switch it manually, it should work out whether it's light mode or dark mode anyway. And my Mac is actually set to dark mode. If you see the taskbar there, it's uh, um, set to a dark. So we're going to go in and we're going to add a um, a a little um, routine that I wrote called and uh, here say file project um, add. called FMX dark mode. Okay, there it is. What this is, this is an FMX unit and it uses um, the FireMonkey platform services or the RTL runtime library platform services to ask the operating system, do you support dark mode? Now, um, the reason that it's set up with this conditional compilation, you can see here that it's grayed out some things. The reason is that this unit will work on Mac and Windows. Now on Windows, you don't have this platform services for the, um, currently anyway, you don't have the platform services to say whether it's a, a dark mode or light mode. Um, so in Windows at the moment, we use a little bit of a, a trick and that is to read the registry and see what the actual mode is. But if I go in here and I say Alt 11, that, oh, that's telling me to use a unit. I'm going to say use dark mode and say implementation. Okay. And then if I um, go down into the form great. So if I do this and then again, select the form itself and in the form create event, which is here. All I need to do now is call that function that says dark mode is enabled, which is this. And if dark mode is enabled, it will then set the theme depending on whatever the default value of the theme is. So if we start off and we can see it's light, if I now run the app, it links it again on my Windows machine. It then will deploy it over to my Mac and runs on my Mac. And after a couple of seconds, the app will run. And there you can see, even though by default I've got it set to light mode, uh, it's detected that it's dark mode and it's turned the switch to the right way. Cool, huh? So your app now detects dark mode and light mode in uh, Mac. But what's more important as well is if I close this app out, and go back to the source code. This source code will now work on Windows as well. And so the app that I showed you last time that we did um, Windows will actually work um, cross-platform. So it's virtually the same app as we did in how to create a Windows app, except now it's cross-platform. Okay, so now we will move on to the Q&A section where I'll be answering the questions live over to me. Over to me. <laughs> I like it. I feel like I'm an anchor and the presenter and everything else. Oh, my camera's wobbling. Sorry, there is no earthquake. I just banged the desk. Um, yeah, okay. So what I wanted to do there was show you um, how easy it is with the Mac. This is a shorter presentation to be built for because if you saw the iOS uh, video, or the iOS webinar, 90% of everything I said about iOS is the same for Mac um, because it's the same. Uh, um, 
it's the same series of steps to set it up. And the thing I want to emphasize here is that when you first set everything up, when you put PA server on the Mac, when you set the connection up on the Mac, once you've done that, that's it. You don't need to redo it. Um, and that, that's quite important to, to get to. Um, I have got some uh, questions about it. <laughs> Terry Oster. Oh, I've got to, sh I've got to show what, what Terry Oster said. They said, magic. Yes, very much magic. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's not. I think the magic is from the development people who actually make Rad Studio work behind the scenes. But uh, I went very fast for change. Will you continue at this rate in the future? Uh, no. Uh, I won't. It depends. Um, the trouble is, a lot of the people that watch um, the webinars, if I speak too quickly, and I do have a tendency to speak too quickly because uh, I drink a lot of coffee and uh, you know, it gets me a bit hyper. Um, if I speak too quickly, then things like the subtitles at the bottom, because of the British accent anyway, um, have trouble keeping up. And not everybody that's watching this webinar um, is speaking English as their native language. We have lots of Germans, Brazilians. Uh, every time uh, people say hello, it's from just about every country you can imagine. So um, I try to not go too fast a pace. Also, these are reference videos as much as anything. Um, when you go into the IDE down on the welcome page, when you first open Rad Studio, down on the welcome page, down on the right, there is a, a section that says learn, and these videos will go into there. Okay, this video is um, already up on YouTube, and uh, you'll be able to get to that um, shortly. The, uh, let me just pick a caption here. The replay for this um, and the slides, oh, that's the wrong one. Hang on, let me just edit that. So it says the right link. Uh, Sorry about that. Proof it is actually live. That's the correct link. So if you go to that uh, tiny URL, um, rad12 Mac EMB, that's the easy way to remember it, um, go to there. That will actually take you straight to the blog post and also the YouTube video, which is up online now of the presentation I just did. Um, I starred lots and lots of questions, um, and I'm going to bring those up now. A um, couple of other things as well. If you want to catch future winter webinars, and we've got some really um, good um, presentations coming up. Uh, let me just pick up the slide that I've got. Um, this Friday, we have a webinar for Codelex. If you've signed up, you'll get told about it anyway. Codelex is a visual way to create the business logic uh, of your app. It's a very, very great ap application. Um, it's going to be presented by a guy called Marco Huss from, uh, and I always say his name differently every time. Uh, he's, he's Dutch. Uh, he's from Holland. Uh, but uh, Marco Huss from uh, GDK and a special surprise guest. Uh, I'm not telling you who it is, but you'll see on, uh, on Friday. And, um, you know, the Friday ones are meant for people that are not learning um, how to do some things. They're more about in-depth topics. Codelex is a li little bit more that. But what we have got coming up with the webinars is um, creating a Linux app. That is going to be a longer presentation because I'm going to create uh, a Linux daemon, uh, a, a Linux command line tool, and a Linux um, GUI app and talk about the differences. And also talk about something called Cross VCL as well, which allows you to create VCL apps on Linux. Um, we've got another presentation about um, making your app invulnerable to hackers or at least detecting uh, problems that might cause you to be vulnerable. Um, we're going to do a cloud app that's going to run in, I think, Amazon, AWS, and a few other things. We haven't done that yet, but um, that's it. And then a thing for the Raspberry Pi. Now, other presentations I've got lined up um, vary from, uh, oh, that's interesting, to uh, are you completely crazy? For example, uh, I... <laughs> That we're going to do an Internet of Things presentation, IoT, and I'm going to drive a robot arm because that's something cool that we can do. I want it to throw knives. The management don't want it to throw knives because they said that's crazy. You know, you don't teach people how to make um, killing murder robots, but I think it would be quite interesting. But we'll see who wins that argument in the meeting that's coming out 
I'm going to have uh, later on today. But um, knife throwing robots, come on, it's got to be a good presentation. Um, but that's all going to be driven through Delphi, and uh, we're going to have an Arduino um, board and a few other things as well. Um, we're also going to have some receipt printers and barcode scanners and uh, right. Uh, a point of sale system basically like a checkout you know like when you go to the checkout at a grocery store or something like that um we've got an ai um topic uh python we're going to do some cool things with python machine machine learning and lots and lots of stuff on security as well how to make your app secure i also have some stuff to do with databases of varying types um everything from interbase to uh mysql um entity uh, DAC, which is a very interesting thing as well. So lots going on. And uh, on the 13th of February, which is a couple of weeks away from where we're recording this now, um, we're going to do a the 29th anniversary of Delphi and talk about a few things, including Nicholas Worth, who unfortunately um, passed away just recently. And Nicholas was the inventor of um, Pascal, which is obviously uh, the language that they're based on. Um, John says, thank you. Look forward to the Linux and Raspberry apps. Yeah, the Raspberry apps, um, there's two ways I'm going to try and do it. One is one is directly right into the Raspberry using Red Studio, and the other one is using some third-party components from TMS. Um, but I'm going to do both just to show the kind of things that are possible. Um, TMS's solution is, is very neat and um uh what's the word i'm looking for it's very well rounded because once you do it for that you can do it for all sorts of other platforms as well um will the source code for the webinars be made available yes this uh, particular webinar i will try and make the source code available i'm not ready yet we've at the moment at the time we're talking at the moment there is an outage on uh one of our key servers and we're dealing with that so it's uh, in interfering a little bit with what we're doing um Someone saying VCL apps on Linux. Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Paradise would be VCL apps for Mac. Actually, the Kevin, I've got some good news for you. This cross VCL does actually target Mac as well. So it's uh, from the same people that do FMX Linux. I'm just going to talk about it because it's a, it's a great component that they have. Um, let's go through the questions. Um, Einstein... 8854, who's one of our frequent flyers, in other words, they're there almost every week, um, said Dev for Mac is not my favorite, but for my knowledge. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, not everybody wants to write Mac apps, and in fact, um, we're fewer re re registrations for this particular webinar than some of the others, which probably reflects the popularity of it um, for Mac apps, but it's one of these things where you should at least know how to do it, so that if you're a developer and your contractor, for example, or you just want to write apps, it's good to know how to do it so that um, if it ever comes up, that topic comes up, at least you can, uh, you know, you can um, you can create an app and understand what needs to be done so you can decide whether it is something that's doable for you in the future. Uh, let's go back to the question. Uh, uh, I, yeah, Conrad. Hello, Conrad. <laughs> My ex sister in law lives in Amersham, which is why I always like it when uh, when Conrad says hello from Amersham. It's a it's a nice market town in England for those that don't know. And uh, it's uh, very close to where I used to live. I used to live in Milton Keynes. I was born in London, so uh, as you can tell from the accent, I live in Dallas now, and it is snowy outside uh, right now in Dallas, which is something we don't often have. Very very cold, so it's not good. Um, R1200RS, which I think is a, a motorbike or motorcycle uh, version, used to be, um, said the Gellit server is not accessible. Yes, we're aware of this. It is being worked on at the moment. Um, there's there's an outage. That's all I can say. We're going to post a, uh, an official message about it shortly. Um, Kevin said, how do you verify that your version of PA server matches your IDE? Okay. Uh, and he kind of said, oh, well, that's not moved on since then. When you connect from Rad Studio, let's say 12, and you connect to a Mac that has got an older version of Rad, of Rad um, PA server, what will happen is Rad Studio will say, hey, uh, you're trying to connect to this Mac, but it's got an old, outdated version of PA server on it. Do you want to update it? And actually what it does is it 
pushes the new version of PA Server up to the Mac that you've connected to automatically. You can then go to that Mac and update it and run that install. It tells you what the path is and run that install. It's very easy. You just double click and drag. It's, it's not, not, it's like a two second install. Um, and once you've done that once for your new version of Rad Studio, because you've just upgraded to 12, um, that's it. You shouldn't need to do it anymore after that. Um, so he was kind of, uh, um, Kevin was saying, oh, it's, it's not moved on. Well, I, I honestly, I do a lot of iOS stuff, and uh, I don't find it a problem. And I, I believe me, I use probably more versions than you do, because I use some that don't get released to the public, you know, test trial versions and internal tests and stuff like that and uh and, and i don't find it an onerous task and i do a lot of i'm really um i don't have any patience for equipment that doesn't work put it that way so uh, that's where we're at um terry oster hi terry um said is the 99 uh developer fee to apple a one charge one time charge or annual this is apple and they charge yearly uh, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, Apple, do, working with Apple is never something that's cheap. For the most cost-effective solution I found is to, um, we talked about it in the last um, webinar where we talked about iOS, where we had several solutions for using older equipment. Um, but... I think that if you buy something like a Mac Mini, uh, that would to me was the quick, the the cheapest option or the most cost effective option. I you can get the M1 um, used, and it's still up to date and still able to run the latest versions of um, Mac OS. Uh, that combined with um, the other bits and bobs, I, I found that to be the cheapest option. If you want to, you can get MacBook Airs and stuff like that. But uh, or you go if you really want to just you know buy, get a pile of money and set fire to it, uh, you know you can go for the Mac Pros and all the rest of it. But uh, only crazy people like Holger Flick, my friend Doctor Doctor Flick, um, is is an absolute uh, Apple fanboy and he gets some really great kit. And I'm always so jet jealous of it because quite frankly I, you know i would need to sell a lung and a kidney to afford it but yeah unfortunately with apple it that they, they're very good at making a profit and uh it, it's a 99 dollar fee per year it's not for us it's from apple uh and that's it and uh greg said where can i get that um delphi helmet image and uh, and the answer is, let me just uh, go back to the comments because I did post the answer to that somewhere. Uh, here we go. Um, you can get the images that you see um, in the background, like, like uh, you saw on my background when I was doing the video, because I've just realized I've got a black background at the moment with the, with the logo up there. There, there, yeah. Uh, uh, it reverses my image, so I never get it right. Um, the helmet images that you see on my own um, PC desktop are all from Mid Journey AI. Uh, uh, I, it's by Svelte, uh, who is uh, a user. Delphi user. I actually have contributed towards that um, public repository. Um, it's an open source one, and I've put some new ones. So I've updated it with new Delphi 12 logos and Red Studio 12 and uh, made them bigger. It, uh, uh, that person didn't have, I don't know whether it's a guy or not, but um, they didn't have um, uh, like 2K and 4K resolutions. I think I put some 2K ones up there as well. So if you want some cool backgrounds, go to uh, github.com for slash spell forward slash uh, midjourney dash ai dash delphi dash images and uh, you can get all the images that i use that are not company ones if you say what i mean because i have some that have got company logos on and we, we don't want you to you know think that you are what you're not um i think that's probably covered most of it um so producer martha will be very pleased that we're finishing early because she so poor, poor woman always has to uh, stick it out whilst i'm talking nonsense 24 7 
Um, oh yes, and the other the other thing I, in in this video, you probably heard my cockatiel screaming in the background. Uh, I forgot to turn on noise cancelling, and it, and he is a very loud bird. Someone said it's eighty five decibels, which is like a jackhammer or something. Um, it, he is quite a loud boy. But uh, in in my defence, Michelle said, well, without the cockatiel, then it would be something would be missing. So uh, that's it. Um, that's it. Okay, so I think we've covered it. Um, thanks, uh, Mr. Ave Fell. Nice to watch Embarcadero webinars on X. Yes. And the reason we use a package called Restream, and uh, our normal regular webinars for you know releases and things like that, we use um, GoToWebinar. Now, GoToWebinar's got some very nice features in it, and actually, the resolution of me is probably a bit blurry on replays and things like that. We're going to work out why that is. But uh, we find that Restream is much more effective because it can stream to multiple platforms at the same time and gives a much more TV-like um, experience. So I can do things like this lower third that you see across the bottom here. And let's see if I can point to the right one. Yes, and I can also uh, put up QR codes and things like that. And if you scan those with your cell phone or something like that, it will take you direct to the page without you having to type in a long URL, which is very useful. Um, it's, it's very good. Um, oh, I'm getting some more questions, so I might as well answer them whilst we're here, as we are early. I run Delphi on Parallels with my MacBook Pro. Yes, um, we did quite a lot of work on Rad Studio to make it work a bit better with Parallels because um, the most recent version of Parallels, I understand there was a couple of bugs that they had, not us, theirs. I mean... You know, we have our own issues, but um, Parallels did some weird things with some menus and stuff like that. And I know they've released at least one fix for um, it, fix some stuff with Office and for Red Studio and a few other things as well. Um, I personally don't use Parallels. I actually have a the real Mac Mini. You can't see it because of the green screen, but it's behind me. Uh, and then I remote to it. As you saw, I was using a, a kind of remote desktop. I actually use um, Google Remote Desktop, which uh, allows me to connect to any of my machines from anywhere in, on any device. So I can literally connect to Windows Box from uh, sitting in a, an aircraft flying, you know, to the UK from America or something like that um, with a Chromebook. You know, it, it's amazing. So um, I do like that. And, of course, it's free as well, which is very interesting. Um, what's that? Doug says he's used, um, sorry, Doug, I'll come back to that one in a minute. Doug says he's used Delphi on Parallels in a Mac Mini M1. Yeah, I've got a Mac Mini M1. Um, I, I mean, I, I know plenty of our own developers at Embarcadero use Macs. Uh, and uh, Dr. Holger, Holger Fleck, again, very good friend of mine, uh, he, he uses Apple hardware all the time, um, but he's slightly better kit than me. Most people do, um, but uh, it works fine. Parallels with Windows, as uh, Gary said, works better on an Intel chip. Yeah, the advantage here is that you can run Rad Studio on your Apple hardware, and then you still need PA server to connect to it from within the virtual machine, um, the Parallels machine. But you get that full, um, you know, that full Mac experience, which. Uh, I mean, I have both available, and I prefer Windows, but I, I'm a kind of weird guy. I did, I should point out before people say, oh, well, you're just a Windows fanboy. Actually, I've been in the industry long enough that I started out on Unix machines way before um, Windows, and actually DOS has only just been, uh, I think DOS 2 or something like that, had just been released when I first started in the industry. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll take anything that works. Um... <laughs> and Doug says, unfortunately, my database work enabled me to boil tea on the Mac Mini M1. Yeah. You know, I once had a, a guy, we went to do a demo of a product, not not with Embarcadero, but with, with someone I was writing some code for. And we demonstrated the product, and the, the head of sales was there demonstrating our product. And the customer was one of these really awkward, you know the guys. I don't need to say what it is, but really awkward. And he said, it was a time clock and there was a, like a door opener that would open like a one of those, you know, barriers that look like they're going to chop you into pieces, you know, like turnstile. That's the word I'm looking for. 
and uh, and uh, and we demonstrate to the head of IT. Everybody in the company was sold on the features, and the the the, the guy that was really obnoxious said. It's great. Yeah, it's got all the features we want. It's at the right price, blah, blah, blah. I'll buy it if it can make me a cup of tea. So we said, okay, go go, go and have a five-minute break. Come back and we'll get it to make tea. And they're like, yeah, whatever. So they went away. And whilst they were away, we grabbed a kettle uh, uh, the, you know, to make the tea, took the plug off, plugged it into one of our relays, and then uh, when they came back in, they swiped the card to come back into this meeting room, which then triggered the relay and turned on the kettle and made a cup of tea for them. And that's, uh, um, yes, we did get the sale. But, you know, never, ever challenge a software developer and a hardware guy to uh, do something like, oh, I'll believe it when I see it, you know, when it makes me a cup of tea. Because we are crazy enough that we will actually go ahead and do it. So uh, there you go. Um Gary says, when is Delphi Rad Studio 12 coming out? Uh, it's out already. So uh, how did you miss our announcements? There are so many of them. It's available now. Um, like I say, there is a bit of an outage at the moment. It's causing a problem. Um, so you might have some trouble downloading things. But uh, um, when that's resolved, and I'm, I'm sure they're, they're working on it, um, then you can just go and get Rad Studio 12. It's there now. Um, if what you mean is when is Rad Studio 12 Community Edition coming out, the answer is we don't have a time scale for that. Right now, the Community Edition is 11.3 Rad Studio. Yeah, there you go. So that, that I knew that question was coming. Is the Community Edition 11 or 12? The answer is 11.3. Okay. But that said, you can still create uh, um, uh, Mac apps uh, with 11.3. It'll work absolutely fine. And... Uh, Oh, no. I, I'm not going to post this uh, comment up um, because I feel sorry for him, but Sergio uh, Bonfiglio uh, says, that unfortunately, his dog passed away. Those of you that watch these webinars um, regularly will know I have two dogs that sit in my office. And, uh, and uh, you, you know, they're not getting any younger. <laughs> they're 11. And uh, normally my, my little terrier sits down at my feet here. He's actually out in the other room at the moment. And I have a retriever as well. And my surname is Barker. So, you know, I've got to like dogs, don't I? But, uh, you know, Serge, Sergio, I'm sorry that your dog passed away. The, the saddest part of having a dog is that they, they, you know, live shorter lives than we do. Um, but, you know, I... I I, I know exactly how painful it must be, and, I, and I, I'm sorry for you. I hope you uh, you, you get over it and uh, and things move on. You know, remember the good things about the dog. That's my advice. Okay. And everybody is saying, so Gary says, Barker would be a cool name for your next cocktail. I'll tell you a sad fact about that. <laughs> when I was a young man, I went and got a job for a while. I just... I, I'm still coding, but I want I needed some more money. This was in the like uh, mid eighties, I suppose. And unfortunately, I worked in a kennels <laughs> as a kennel manager. And uh, can you imagine how many jokes I endured? Going, wait, you're the kennel manager, and your name is Barker. You're Mister Barker. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Hilarious, but uh, Barker. Yeah, my cockatiel's name is Woody, like Woody Woodpecker. He, he's a great bird. He's really lovely. He'll sit on my shoulder and give me kisses and stuff like that. He sings all sorts of tunes and he talks and stuff like that. Anyway, um, uh, good luck to Sergio. I hope uh, you know you feel better soon. Remember the good points about your dog. Uh, I think that's it. I think we've covered all the questions. Uh, we're actually five minutes short of the hour, but um, you know, I always say this to everybody: if you um, if you've got anything that uh, you need to bring up, feel free to um, email me. Uh, you can go to the blog, and uh, we've got my email address in most of the posts anyway. But just in case you need it, it's ian.barker at uh, mbarkadero.com. And then uh, we will uh, make sure that um, if you email me and you've got a question, if I can answer it, I will do. 
Um, it's not for technical support. I'm not going to give you support. <laughs> I've got way too many things to be doing to give you technical support. I will try and answer some of your questions if they're technical. If I don't know the answer, then I will try and pass you on to someone that does know the answer or at least get the answer back from them. Um, you know, if there's something you don't like about the company, please let us know uh, because I want to know. And, I, and I, I'm able to pass that on and discuss it with colleagues who can influence some of the things that we do in the company we're a big company we can't just like change everything like that we can't give you the product completely for free uh you know it's got to be practical we can't reveal things that might give our competitors a competitive advantage um you know nobody's gonna do that it's it's crazy like you know uh what's the name of the kentucky fried chicken they still keep their herbs and spices secret right so that uh, people can't copy them. <laughs> uh, well, you know, some of our, our things are like the special blend of herbs and spices. Uh, we can't tell you it because, you know, other people would steal our ideas and then we be out of business. But um, if there's something you, you, you like or don't like, tell me and I'll pass it on and, and, and we'll do our best. We want you to be using our products and to be happy with them and to, uh, yeah, for it to enhance your development because we believe if you get genuine value out of the product and that it helps you, uh, you know, become a better coder or at least fulfill your, your, uh, your needs as a coder, then it's, it's, it's a straightforward, uh, um, sum, isn't it? That if you're happy, then you're going to keep, uh, with us and keep being a customer. And that's what we want. We want you to be uh, using rad studio and, uh, Delphi anyway, uh, we'll call it a day <laughs> and, uh, thanks for joining us. See you uh, on Friday for Codelex, and then see you next Tuesday as well if you're watching this live. If not, um, catch the replays on YouTube. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye.